Hello and welcome to today's class. Uh, I apologize for not making it to class this morning. Um, I have an ulcer on my eye. That's crazy, crazy. I take drops and it burns and all that stuff. So send me positive energy. I'm not really happy about this, but um, Nonetheless, I thought um, I'm still feeling great and you know and whatnot. So let's put this together as a video instead of us meeting together and Today's topic is chapter six. We're going to be talking about social groups now <clears throat> Leading to this time we have been talking about topics such as culture socialization and institutions and structure these are the the basic elements that we've built through this class already and we have to understand that there's a certain scaling sort of uh perspective that we can take when we talk about culture and we often talk about that on a grand scale such as you know french culture you know national culture american culture you know these kinds of things that this can all be scaled down all of those principles the principles of culture socialization institutions and structure status roles which we'll be getting into in a little bit here can they can relate to the larger picture of our entire society or they can relate to every single group of which we are a part so our families our friends any clubs or organizations that we belong to a church that we will be belong to any one of those things has all of those elements as well and so even in our classroom our classroom is a social group and <clears throat> it has all the elements of its own society embodied within that small group. So we can then look at groups as microcosms of society here. So let's take a look at the groups that usually we encounter in our world here that how we're going to see that how they relate to status and role and social groups themselves the definition of that are groups that interact frequently and establish identity this is different than other kinds of gatherings of people we're going to call things social groups only if they meet certain criteria other gatherings of individuals include aggregates this would be individuals at a beach or at a concert Although I will admit that there's a established sort of a connection that happens sometimes, you know, sometimes you're at the beach and you're looking around, everybody's looking at each other going, yeah, we're all enjoying the beach, sort of a connection. Certainly at a concert, it's all the fans, you know, and how they interact. But we can't necessarily say that a bunch of people at a rock concert necessarily constitutes a group because they don't necessarily interact frequently. There's that piece there. They may establish an identity of fans of the artist, but they don't interact frequently. This is an aggregate. It's a gathering of people, a crowd of individuals. All of those are what sociologists would call an aggregate. There's also a concept called category. Now, this is, it's an easy one to get your head wrapped around because you can use the term categorization. Now, a category of people are individuals that meet a specific criteria to be included in a category. It goes the gamut. Graduates from high school is a category of people. People with a doctorate, a category of people. The 1% a category of people based on their wealth but also categories like gender and race so each one of the lgbtq are categories of individuals all the race designations that we have are categories of individual a person's religious stance may has a category standpoint to it you know a person who's a christian or a muslim or jewish that's a category that the individual may attain but there's also maybe in their particular um institution that's more of a, a social group because they interact but you can't necessarily say that all christians are a group or all blacks are a group or all lesbians are, are a group this is not 
They don't interact frequently. We make a false judgment when we think that they're all the same. Of course, that's the source of, of prejudice and discrimination. And so category is what, how, just how we organize people. An individual can belong to multiple categories based on whatever characteristic we're looking at in order to organize people. Some of them are powerful. Racial categories are really big. Gender and sexuality categories are really big, but they're categories, they're not social groups. So we approach them a little bit different when we talk about those things in sociology. Every social group has a culture, has its own culture, has statuses and roles within that particular culture, and has a process of socialization. Every social group. So, one that we can throw out there pretty easily is the classroom. Our classroom is a social group. It meets the criteria of interacting frequently. We interact on, a, on, a, on every Tuesday and Thursday most of the time, uh, interact a little bit online. We're all part of a larger community, KVCC, and there's a, a, essentially sort of a sense of identity, a temporary sense of identity of being a part of this group, like you're in Mark Cavanaugh's Soch 101 class that meets on Tuesdays and Thursdays. You know, that's sort of a status that you have. You're a student in that class, and therefore you're, you're part of that group. There's a culture in our class. There's a culture of the expectations of our behavior. So I think it, yeah, my role as a teacher, the way that I teach, the way that I go about it, as you have found out, it's largely lecture-based. I do like some interactive, but it's kind of a show and tell a lot of the times with a few activities spread around and some dialogue. You know that humor, of course, is very okay in my classes that there's uh, a shared adventure that I try to create, that we're exploring really neat things. And that's my role as a leader in the group to do that. You also bring your personalities and your history to the class and enrich that class. This is a, a cooperative adventure. Uh, if, you were, if you were just sitting there, you know, if you're just like a bunch of recorders sitting and you know, that would be sent to your home, I mean, how boring would that be, particularly for me? Um, but we have established that culture, even to the point of where people sit. I know that Nate tends to move around a little bit, so he's breaking the culture all the time. But people tend to um, sit in the same places. There's really even no guidance associated with that. Uh, you come to class with uh, the expectation for, for taking notes and the... Uh, role that you have of asking questions, getting clarity on assignments. You know that there's an expectation to be able to come after class and talk to me about these things. There are different statuses, students, teacher. Um, I Admittedly, I have a, there's dual relationships that can occur. I have individuals in the class, uh, such as Natasha, who is also a psych major, so she's my advisee, so I'm a teacher and an advisee, and I, we have Hunter in the class, and Hunter is, the, uh, is a friend, and, a, and a, him and his father are good friends of mine. I got to know them over the years here at KVCC, and um, so you see sometimes there's multiple statuses and relationships that people have among, among um, the members of the group, and those all kind of mix into the culture of the class. There is even, as we just talked about, a process of socialization, and that is teaching and transferring not only the content of the class, that's sort of the function of the class, but the socialization happens in those first few classes in the materials that are provided both in the class and online that orient you to understanding what to expect in the class. So certainly the course syllabus is a document that it's a standardized document used in all of the classes at KVCC to do some of that socialization as to how things are going to go down in the class. And then there's the use of Brightspace as a repository for information and the conduit through which you submit your assessments. And the, the notion that the cultural norm within all of the classes that I've defined 
and designed are that there's this presence of a course book, which is not universal. That's a unique part of my classes specifically, where you get that information combined with oftentimes a free or download, you know, uh, textbook. And so there's two books, so that cultural part. And learning about that is sometimes, you know, is certainly an important part of socialization. But I'm right at the point in, in the year, in the semester, where I'm, you know, some people in my online classes have come in and they might have missed that piece of instruction. And I'm actually, you know, uh, in the process with some of my students reorienting to say, OK, if you're, if you're looking for the instructions on these assignments, bring them back. You know, we have a Zoom meeting or something like that. And we kind of bring people back into the fold of the expectations of the culture of this class. So everything that we learn about culture you can take and look at our classroom, you can look at your family, you can look at your workplace, you can look at any clubs that you belong to, you can look at any church you belong to, and you're gonna see the replication of these structures happening in all of those areas. So in a way, just like psychology is learning about yourself, sociology not only gives you the opportunity to learn about the larger culture and certainly international multicultural perspectives but it really gives you an appreciation of the concentric replication of those right down to the families you can you can start looking at your own family and the other groups that i mentioned from the same lenses that we use to understand sociology so all the the, the functional lens the conflict lens, the um, postmodern lens, the social, social interactionist lens, exchange theory, all of those. You can look, we can look at our classroom in each one of those and see human social structure replicating itself. Just really, really neat discovery to have when you're studying something like sociology. Now let's take a deeper dive into uh, social groups themselves. There are different types of groups that you can belong to. And, and along with looking glass self, which we'll get into eventually, um, one of my favorite things to talk about is the types of groups. Because we divide them as we do in social sciences, we like names for everything. So we divide them into three types. There are primary groups, secondary groups, and reference groups. And just make note that the uh, quiz that is due for this week is this, this stuff. I'm gonna be asking you to do this. Now, primary and secondary groups can look at them. These are groups first, and this is gonna be important when we talk about reference groups. You belong to primary and secondary groups. You do not belong to reference groups. So let's hold on, hold on that for just a second. I'll get to that when I finish the description of primary and secondary. Primary groups, probably the salient characteristic of primary groups, is that they are central to your identity. These are very important emotionally, intellectually, and in terms of your self-identity, the constructed aspect of yourself that you have, your internal schema that you have constructed throughout your life, these groups are vital. Often they include family, close friends, your work, for many, their church, for many. These are things that if I interviewed somebody and asked them about themselves, they would refer to the statuses and roles that they had in their primary groups. So they're also, in many ways, they tend to be permanent. They become aspects of our life that don't go away. We are continually going to be part of our family, continually to be part of our work until we'll get into that, you know, when there's a social change that happens when we retire and what does that mean when one of your primary groups is gone, when families change, when you're, you know, when maybe you're the last of your generation still alive and what does that mean when your primary groups start to go away in that transition and why not either finding a new primary group or establishing life without that particular primary group. Just, it's just, they're just important. You wouldn't want them to go away. You want to keep them around. You want to maintain memberships in those for a very long time, perhaps your entire life. Secondary groups 
are utilitarian. That's kind of the salient feature of secondary groups. They can be vitally important, no doubt, no doubt. And we can have primary groups. In fact, primary groups are, can be utilitarian, but they, secondary groups can be very important and very utilitarian, but there's maybe not the expectation that we will spend the, our entire lives in those places in those groups, nor is there the expectation that they are core to our, ident our identity forever. Even though for periods of time, they may be central to our identity. They don't necessarily translate into primary groups, so sort of like a um, temporary primary group, and then it doesn't become primary. And where I'm going with this is, of course, school. When you came to KVCC, you added yourself to a secondary group, maybe multiple secondary groups. First, you're a student at KV. Second, you're a student in whatever program or major. Third, you're a member of each one of the little groups that we call classes. Those are all secondary groups. Now, secondary groups, you join them to, as a means to an end. So you joined the my sociology class because sociology was a class that you had listed uh, on your uh, the courses that you need to take to graduate. I am absolutely sure from my experience in here that this group is important to you. They've been, I've been very happy with everybody's uh, perception on the importance of this and, and engagement in the class. But I hope you're not hope I hope you're not expecting to be in this class forever. That's your, it is a temporary group that you belong to as a means to an end. You're enjoying it, you're learning, you're expanding, all of those things, but it's temporary. You're not gonna be a KV forever. It's temporary. Um, many jobs, like, you know, I myself right now, and I would have, I would have gone into this in class a little bit, um, in a way, it still seems a little far away, but in a way I'm approaching retirement. I'm 57 years old. I, 62 is the age in which I can retire. I have little intent on retiring at that point, but I am looking at a period of time in my own life where what has been essentially kind of a, that, like that pseudo primary, secondary group has been my career. I enjoy my career. I see myself deeply, deeply part of my identity as teacher, professor, particularly at KV. I care very deeply about this institution and the people there and the students there. Yet I'm approaching, contemplating this idea of that being different. And so even our jobs that we may love and establish, uh, they're there's a secondary group component to that. So each of you is belong to many of those groups. You might belong to a professional organization. You might belong to the snowmobile club. You might belong to the church, might be leaning more secondary, less primary, more, you know, what am I getting out of it as opposed to, you know, core identity. And certainly many churches want to move you over from strictly utilitarian over to more core identity. You know, it's almost a mission of the church to move people in that direction. And so all of these groups that you belong to have this sort of utilitarian, not, not it, utilitarian has this sort of using quality to it, which is true, but it's not a negative connotation. I, you know, I joined the, uh, the group here at KVCC as a faculty member, and it was utilitarian. It was a job, paid my bills, you know. Doesn't mean I can't get a whole lot of other benefits out of it, you know, friendships that I've created and individuals who I've been able to interact with over all of these years, certainly been core to my being. Um, but it still has that tinge of utilitarian uh, component to it. Now that brings us to the third one which is reference groups, which is always a really fun one to talk about. Reference groups are groups that you do not belong to, the first, but they're still a part of your life. They're part of your life because you're a wannabe. So, for example, let's say there are some individuals in the class who are in either tracking nursing or they're in the uh, nursing program. They wanna be a nurse someday. So, 
Reference groups, if you look at the term, we refer to them as guidelines for our own behavior so that we can be like or eventually be members of that group. So anything that's like, so all the concepts in our world, I'm going to quickly, you know, I don't want to have this video go too long here. We can look at role models. We can look at, uh, you know, people who we admire, famous individuals. We can look at um, people within uh, religious organizing, you know, when, when we think about, well, in my, own, in my own Christian journey, when we look at the life of Jesus, you could say, well, I want to, you know, can't be possible, but you know, I want to be like that person. I want to live my life to be the, in that status of being, you know, uh, like him. And we can look at those things. Everything that's sort of like the wannabe falls into this category of reference groups, including all of your majors, including all the things. Let's say you're a budding YouTube star and you're looking at the, the YouTube stars that are making a living with that. That's your reference group. That you want to be a part of that, you want to be in that. Now you're already a YouTuber, but you're not a YouTuber doing it for the living. You know, kind of thing, there's nuances there. Uh, so in a way, you're uh, uh, a YouTuber, but you're not quite at the status that you're. As a musician, I find myself aligned to the other musicians when I meet people in my classes, but abroad when we're talking, when we have an opening act or we're opening up for another act, uh, there's, there's a lot of camaraderie among the shared identity of being a musician and where we're at. You know, when do you start calling yourself a professional musician versus I do it for a hobby, you know, those kinds of things and uh, just all of these ways. But oftentimes, I would, you know, throughout my life, I would look at other bass players or other musicians and say, yeah, you know, I, I want to be part of the group that's, you know, part of the category, actually, part of the category of individuals that had that level of skill or um, had that level of doing enough gigs or, you know, whatever. And so reference groups are groups to which we refer to in order to modify our own behavior. Membership of that group is actually pretty rare while they're a reference group until we become part of that group. And that group becomes either a primary group or a secondary group once you become a member. So making those uh, differences there, what I'm going to be asking you to do in the quiz is to write about and give examples of your primary and secondary groups, making those. You're free to throw a little stuff in there about sometimes it's vague. So maybe right now being a student is really, really important to you, really core to your identity. And if people ever met you and they said, so what's going on in your life right now? I said, I'm a student at KVCC and that, you know, a big part of my life and it feels primary. Include that in your, in your, in, include that in your descriptions or if there's other aspects of your life that are like that. And so look forward to seeing some of the answers coming out of that um, in that quiz. Now, one of the other components of, of studying social groups is leadership. Now, leadership we're, you know, we're, we're gently making our way toward the understanding of group process and ultimately the topic from a sociological perspective of politics, which really has to do less with this national chaos that we're sometimes seeing and more about the management of group behavior, power, resources, and whatnot, looking at it from a very gen generic point of view. And that, that way we can see it in all the different groups. All the groups have some sort of leadership, even if it's might maybe informal. Maybe the, the group operates in a way that we all come to agreement. That means everybody's a leader. And the, the, the decision-making system, which is the politics, the process of the management of power and decision and resources, plays out in a democratic standard but even then you will see stronger personalities, expertise coming to the front depending on what's being talked about. And we see the manifestation of leadership within groups all the time. Even 
in groups where there's a particular individual who has the specific status of being a leader, so the president or the, the leader of the group or the, the teacher in the classroom, you know, those individuals that their status includes the function of leadership might, in fact, it's sort of a, a sign of, you know, in the study of leadership, it's sometimes of, there are circumstances in which the leader bequests that power, they release that power that they legitimately have to others and they decide because this is something I'd rather have consensus on than determined by my leadership uh, status. Went a little far down that particular description. Let's take a look at the different kinds of leadership that we might experience in different groups. So leadership comes in, instrumental is the leadership skill. Actually, let me, let me pull back a little bit. Not so much types of leaders, although individual leaders will have their preferred style. Some leaders, you know, very instrumental, let's say. Others are much more about process. You know, they'll have their expressions of their personality leaks into the way they engage in leadership. However, every leader has the opportunity to do any one of these things in the function of leadership. So you're not stuck. You might prefer some, it's just like learning styles, right? Learning styles are not, not a disability. We have to use all of our senses in order to learn and we might feel way more comfortable in certain ways, but that in no way restricts us from using other ways to learn. In fact, using other ways might be beneficial and you'll become a multimodal learner. That's a conversation for another day. Okay, so we have instrumental leadership. These are individuals that are goal-directed. They're instrumental, they, we, we, here's the group, I'm the leader of the group, let's organize, let's do these things so that we accomplish the goals of the group. Another is expressive. This is the individual or the, uh, the, the time in which a leadership, leadership might say, wait a minute, um, people are feeling left out, they're feeling bad, they're feeling negative, there's a low morale, there's, an, there's a focus on the emotional world that is taking place within the, um, within the group. And this is vital. I mean, there's the goal directedness, you know, where you're charging forward, but there's also the taking care of your group. If somebody's feeling left out or somebody doesn't like the way things are going, to be able to address that, be able to deal with that, and to know that the group has that stuff under, under wraps as well. And next, piece of leadership here is, of course, democratic individuals. Again, a, this might be a core way in which somebody likes to act as a leader, but it's also a process of decision making. There might be some aspects of a group that are subject to, let's see what everybody wants to do. You might find that that is not the case in most of your classes. So even though our class might have some very, you know, very, um, you know, loose ends and whatnot. It's pretty rare that you're going to find a classroom where the students, you know, elect on what we're going to cover in class, you know, that they vote on that. That's pretty rare. It does happen. Um, not my style, but the, um, too controlling for that apparently. And, uh, but democratic groups uh, that, that process decision-making is done through the democratic process, meaning people vote and the, and the majority carries the decision. There can also be times in which leaders don't lead. They leave people alone. Laissez-faire means to, be, to leave alone. Um, when you're working with expert groups, people who are very good at what they do, they don't need someone looking over their shoulder, they don't need, you know, detailed analyses of what they're doing in their productivity and whatnot. They're, uh, they work best when they're working independently. Very, very important quality here at KVCC for large, largely the instructors that you have are experts in their field. Many are experts at teaching as well. And so the general sense of leadership at KVCC is to leave 
people alone just do we're not supervised we don't have time cards we don't have you know those well we're supervised but it's it's for the it's for the um the legal aspects of what we do make sure we put grades in on time make sure we're fair you know and stuff like that but there, i'm not subject to an authority telling me what to teach in fact that's kind of a sacred place for faculty is that uh freedom of um the, the freedom to be able to teach and talk about whatever it is I feel is important is a sacred component, a very important, relatively unchangeable component of teaching uh, at a college that I enjoy. But laissez-faire leadership can sometimes be, you know, the less I say, the better this will function. And I'm sure, you know, kind of your kid, in your family, your kids are arguing about and sometimes you have to intervene, you know, Sometimes you're expressive, let's talk about feelings. Sometimes you're instrumental and say, you go to your room, you go to your room, stop, you know, kind of thing. Sometimes you're democratic, they're arguing over, you know, what movie they're gonna watch, so let's have a show of hands. And then sometimes, you know, you know what, you and Billy need to go work this out. Let your kids work it out and in their fine ways as an ed instructional and educational tool on their developing ability to do so. And then there's authoritarian, there's author, ooh, author, author, that's not even a real word. That should be authoritarian. Sorry about that. I've had this slideshow forever and never noticed. Authoritarian is, I put it last, um, it's a sign when, you know, faculty can't even read their own slideshow. Uh, authoritarian is the perspective, my way or the highway. Now, I put it in this list. It's often experienced negatively, but at the same time, it also has utility. There are times in which leaders have to set the line, in which they have to you know, come down. How you go about that, now, if somebody comes in and they're just their way or the highway all the time, and, and they don't pay attention to expressive, democratic, or laissez-faire, or even instrumental kind of thing. They're just focused on outcomes. That's going to be, that's going to be difficult for people to, to, to deal with. Um, good leaders who recognize the need for authoritarian times will do so in the context of also being expressive leaderships. Here we go. We don't have a choice. We're going, so I'm making that choice, but let's talk about it. Let's support each other through this change. You know, it's us against the decision sort of thing. And so uh, there are ways to be authoritarian when it's necessary, um, but we also recognize that authoritarian leadership, and we'll, we, we see it in, in the descriptions of authoritarian parenting is often not you know, in, when, it's abs, when it's in exclusion of all the other ways in which parents are leaders, then it, it doesn't produce very good outcomes. So, there you go. The group dynamics that occur in terms of all the members of the group, their individual statuses and roles, and the leadership produces the existence of social interaction that we refer to as politics. We'll have, we'll have a whole chapter on politics. Now we, we transition here to the last topic of this particular chapter, and that is the concept of McDonaldization. Now, it's called McDonaldization because the researcher that produced this research uh, credits the uh, institution of McDonald's, which was uh, first first on the line as a um, an organization that had you could purchase restaurants as an entrepreneur and you can f what they called franchise and the the essence of the McDonald's corporation formula was to exactly replicate the experience of customers no matter what McDonald's they were in and so that notion that the founder of McDonald's, founder of McDonald's Corporation, there's actually two brothers called the McDonald's, you know, the McDonald's brothers had this McDonald's restaurant. They're doing really, really great. There was a salesman 
who was selling supplies, came across McDonald's, said it's a great thing, eventually got the money together to buy them out and created McDonald's Corporation. His name was Ray Kroc. And certainly one of the most successful uh, businesses to have ever emerged. And it actually created that notion of a franchise that then other companies, you know, Burger King and other restaurants and whatnot came out with. Um, the franchise being that they're independent owners, but they're using the formula. Now the McDonald's formula is one greatly um, focused on replication of the same experience. In fact, if you're going to be a McDonald's store manager or an owner, you actually have to go to an institution called Hamburger University. What else would it be called? So Hamburger University exists in order to teach the system, to teach the McDonald's system, how they do the work, their formula for success, and clearly it works. They sell billions and billions of hamburgers, right? And they're not the best hamburgers. So, I mean, clearly then I like them, but there are other hamburgers that, that I like better, but uh, despite not having the best hamburgers, they certainly sell the most. Now, an individual by the name of George Ritzer saw this as a uh, great model to describe what is happening in aspects of our society. So, so what if we became, or any institution or any individual became enamored with this idea of a system by which we would manage individuals and their behavior, maximize productivity, maximize profit, how many other areas aside from cooking french fries and hamburgers could we apply this to? And when we apply those particular rules and regulations and how we do business to other aspects of our, of our, of our society, Fitz, Ritzer pointed to this and said, that is, a, that is the process of McDonaldization. I went into that social institution and I McDonaldized it, almost like a verb, taking a noun and converting it to a verb. You've been McDonaldized, you know, to an, to an organization. So what does that mean? What is, what is the success formula? What are the, there's four components to McDonaldization that, um, that George Ritzer found out and wrote about in, in his various books that he's had on McDonaldization. So the first is control and standardization. All aspects of the business are controlled. Uh, the colors of the cups, the numbers of the cups, where everything is located. Uh, if you walk into a bathroom, uh, I'm sorry, if you, gave away my idea. If you walk into a McDonald's anywhere in the world, you know where the bathroom is. You're standing at the counter and almost exclusively, it's on your right down the hall. And that's where the bathroom is. And so these things, just so, you could be anywhere in the world and you walk into a McDonald's and you're like, I know, where, I know how this is working because they're the same everywhere. And so there's been some changes. I mean, there's this, and McDonald's went through a lot of experimenting with the changes with the kiosks. I mean, it was in response a little bit to um, uh, COVID, but you have to understand, they've been thinking about that for a long time, and COVID sort of gave uh, many of the innovators at McDonald's the opportunity to put their ideas to the test and reduce the number of people that are actually uh, at the counter. Now, don't interpret this as a reduction of force because in all actuality, reached out to a couple of McDonald's managers that I know and I asked, you know, what happened with the, with the staff? He said the staff didn't change because there's a, new, there's a new status at McDonald's and that is the individual that actually brings your meal out to you. That was never, unless you ordered something special and they had to make it, you know, they didn't deliver your meal. Now you go in there and it's almost like a restaurant, almost like, you know, a typical restaurant where someone comes and delivers your meal to your table. So there's actually been no change in, you know, general, just people I talk to, no change in their uh, number of staff that they had when they went to the automatic kiosks. But everything controlled, everything counted, everything, you know, all of that stuff. The emphasis on efficiency, everything is timed. The one manager that I, uh, one manager that I do know that was the manager of the Bangor Street uh, McDonald's, 
person I talked to the most about all this stuff said that the average time for a person in the drive-thru should always be below 75 seconds from order to delivery at the window. Every one of them is timed, it's calculated, and individual efficiency is determined through that process with goals set out by McDonald's Corporation, 75 seconds. Everything's predictable. Again, that system of where everything is at, what's in the food, you know, and all that stuff. Although different regions in the world have different food um, based on the cultural norms of that area, but you know, there's standardization within those, within those cultures as well. And calculability, this idea that we're counting everything, we know exactly how many cups, how many covers, how many sundaes, how many hamburgers, how many large fries, medium fries, large fries, you know, all of those things. There's numbers that drive a perspective of the business from that hyper-controlled and standardized perspective. Now, when we see that applied within McDonald's itself, within the organization of McDonald's, we see efficiency, minimization of the time it takes to get people to food. This is the introduction of the fast food industry, okay? Predictability, standardized services, workers' tasks, they're highly repetitive, people become very fast at them. Again, you see the efficiency, highly routine and very predictable. Somebody comes in and they're making sandwiches, they make the sandwich and the, they put the pickles on after the cheese every time. Very rare that they're gonna put the pickles on before the cheese. You know, everything is sort of in its order. Calculability would be the getting large amounts of products for not much money. Workers judge by the speed rather than the quality of their work. You would probably received a hamburger or two where I don't know, it seems like they threw the burger from across the room. It's like offset in the bun or something like that. Again, that speed factor being, and that's why we go there. We don't go, I mean, our expectations are in line with this thing. Our expectation, we're not expecting to get a perfectly made burger. We're expecting to get the thing that we get. Now, interestingly enough, interestingly enough, there has been some, um, uh, my daughter went to Japan and told me that when they were in Japan, they went to a McDonald's and all the food looks exactly like it does on the sign. They're doing something over there. So the Big Mac actually look, you know, they're, you know, in that culture, matching what's, I've never, ever had a hamburger from McDonald's that looks like the sign. And apparently that's something that you might, might have in some countries. Just a little side note there for you. The next is control, standardized, and uniform employees. Uh, replacement by of human with non-human technologies i mean the um the fries which we used to you know throw a number of fries in there that's automated the uh the, the creation of the burgers automated as much as can be automated is done so again for that standardization now there is you know of course ritzer is a is a critique of the over expansion of this particular notion to other areas of our society. There, a family shouldn't operate this way. It loses its humanity. A school shouldn't operate this way. And he really is uh, kind of the, the, the balance between the efficiency that comes with organizing this way, with maintaining human organize, uh, human um, organizations and, and interactions and keeping the work valued. You know, the individuals just don't, you know, there's a, uh, through, ever since the industrial revolution, there's been a, um, an increase in the number of kind of dehumanizing jobs from, from a philosophical perspective. This is not from an individual perspective. An individual can work on an assembly line and feel very good about what they're doing for work and feeling very proud of what their work is. It's, it's separate from that, but assembly line work being part of a larger machinery uh, from some philosophical perspectives is sort of a diminishing of the capacity of human beings. We could do so much more than just be the living, breathing part of a larger machine. And so the critique 
of this is the, we, we have to be on the watch that we do not go too far with this. Just like, just like the watchdogs for genetic engineering or um, artificial intelligence, there's always, you know, how far do we go with these things? So let, let's take an example about some of the uh, McDonaldization comes, it comes in different names, it comes in, in different ways, but it can manifest itself in a place like KVCC. So if I was going to think about how has McDonaldization impacted the world here at KVCC, and certainly, so we take a look at control, and when we look at uh, just one example, the transition that we made, some of you have probably been here for a while that you know that we used to use Blackboard as our learning management system, which is Brightspace. We transitioned to Brightspace. Now here at KV, when we're, when we're using Blackboard, we, we put together a group, we're gonna look at that, you know, do we wanna use Blackboard? We spent about a year looking at all the different learning management systems, la di da put our whole perspective together, and we had decided we were gonna go with a product called Canvas, and lo and behold, unknown to us, the main community college system was engaged in a conversation with Brightspace to standardize Brightspace across the entire system. So despite our work, very disappointing, everybody had to transition to Brightspace. Some people, you know, to me, a learning management system is a learning management system. I don't really have a dog in that fight. But, uh, and I actually like Brightspace, so I think it's a very workable system for what I do in it. The, um, but there was, a, there was an effort to standardize, so no matter where a student went in the uh, community college system, they all experienced Brightspace. Now this was actually on the coattails of the University of Maine system doing the same thing. When I was working for the University of Maine, they had five or six learning management systems the faculty could pick whichever one they wanted. Imagine that. And then they standardized to Blackboard and then they too, great sales job on the part of Brightspace, they came in and they converted both the University of Maine system and the Maine Community College system to one learning management system. So if you go from KVCC to the University of Maine in Farmington, you're gonna be using Brightspace. That, at least that piece. Now we can see how that would make things more efficient. It was a standardization that would say, okay, if you're gonna teach, we're, if we teach you how to do, use Brightspace or you learn it by rote, then when you go to the University of Maine, they don't have to teach you. So that's cool. You don't have to relearn these systems. You know, they shouldn't be barriers to your success. So it's a way, again, you know, looking again, you know, not only is it a standardization, but it was an efficient move as well. Part of the efficiency, let's all have one system. Now let's, let's keep with that particular example here. So you can see the standardization of the learning management system across all of the colleges and all the courses allowed us to have a uniform practice. It made, it, it made training and training, the development of training materials more efficient. People could just learn at one time and it applied to all of their different classes for the most part. It allowed for some predictability you know where to find things. Now there's still, there's still diversity between classes, but in essence, Blackboard allowed us to, you could enter a Blackboard course and it would look nothing like other Blackboard classes. Uh, there's less customizability and that was a very recognizable tone to the use of Brightspace, just giving you an inside look into how we were examining these things. One of the things that was attractive for the system office was that you can't change the layout very much from a user perspective. You can't change, so every class looks alike, you know, in the general layout of things. And the standardized menu items, standardized menu items across the top, you know, and all those things. There might be some diversity and some people might put things that you can customize folders and they might organize things a little bit different over on that left menu. But nonetheless, they all pretty much look alike. And so with very little ability for individual, you know, realignment of things, the experience of Brightspace as you move from class to class, in fact, became more predictable. 
And then finally, under one system, well, that, that by having everybody use that same system, the administrators can go into that system and gather data from a, from a specific set of data. Now that particular aspect of Brightspace is confounding us because it's rather complex. And so we're still learning how to do that with this relatively new system to us. But the data is there. How long you, I can see how long a student has been in the, been in the um, class. Um, I can see what you've opened up and what you haven't opened up. I can see what quizzes you've done and all that stuff from a data perspective, not even with having going into the class itself and just physically looking, can actually get how much time you spent, what time of day it was when you logged in, all of this data. That I tend not to really take a lot of time looking at that, but it's all part of that ability to calculate the efficacy, the usefulness, and the utility of that particular system. So, well, how far do we go with that? How far do we go in terms of analyzing your online behavior and whatnot? Uh, is again, it's an ethical question in terms of how much data that we actually gather or, or whether we use that data or not. Sometimes collecting the data is the nature of the system and sometimes we just don't allow ourselves to uh, access that data. And so one example of that is if you send an email to another student within Brightspace, or it actually uses our uh, Outlook system, um, there are very, I mean, that is, that is a system that belongs to us. So ultimately, there's someone up the chain that has access to all of your emails, but it is not something that is just doled out in terms of uh, access uh, for people in the college. You know, we purposefully respect the privacy of certain, certain things within uh, the college environment. But so that's an example, just using um, KVCC and the standardization of our learning management system as an example of McDonaldization's uh, components. You could probably imagine where this might go too far when we get too mechanized, too solid, too, you know, it becomes impersonal. And, and cold in terms of our experience, even with other people. So certainly we want to, um, to be on the, on the watch out for that. Uh, another, i just throw out a couple of these things. Um, the self-checkouts that have become increasingly popular in big box stores and whatnot, that's another example of uh, McDonaldization. Uh, essentially transferring skills uh, to you without paying you. Uh, you. You actually become your own cashier and uh, certainly more efficient. Uh, all the systems are guided to, they time how long it takes for you to go through and get your, get your stuff uh, packed up. Um, the, the system of bags that we have now and how different stores have responded to that, bags that used to be free, you now have to, and, the, and, it, and it's, a, uh, it's a honor system. I mean, I go to, I go to um, Walmart and at the end of my transaction during a self-checkout it asks me how many bags I've used and if I say two it's going to charge me I think for that and I, well there's cameras everywhere and there's people there but I'm not sure how they would enforce it if I said none and I actually had a bag but anyway we see kind of the mechanizations of that and understand that while there are movements in our society and technology and whatnot, at the same time, there are people like Ritzer who are keeping an eye on these things and, and providing aggressive critique to make sure that these things don't go too far. Now that brings us to the end of the class today, but it, it, it's, and, it, and I end with, you know, looking at what is uh, the assessment for this, and it's just simply chapter six quiz, and as I said earlier in this lecture, that has to do with your primary and secondary groups. So um, I'll end it there. That's the, that's the class for today. I look forward to seeing you folks on Tuesday. Uh, good luck with the assessments. We have two chapters, chapters five and six that are due this week, and I look forward to Tuesday, and have a great weekend. Looks like it's gonna be warm, maybe some rain, too thrilled about that, but warm temperatures are always, always welcome. So have a great weekend, and I will see you next week.